Shalom and welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Pastor Scott Delane with Holy Impact Ministries, and I'd just like to welcome you to the truth of prophecy. Today we're going to be talking about a couple of different things that have to do with prophecy that we need to be on the lookout for. One of them is something that uh, has been around for quite some time, and the other is kind of new to us. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about some old and some new things uh, today concerning today's Prophecy Watch. But basically what we're going to be talking about are the Noahide Laws. Now, these were very popular uh, a few years back, and uh, they seem to be, once again, kind of making their rounds throughout the community. And so we thought that we might uh, talk a little bit about these Noahide Laws and what they are. Certainly in our ministry, the question has come up. And uh, we want to be able to let people know exactly what these Noahide Laws are are all about, and how it is that they could affect us in these last days that we're now living in. And so, the first thing I'd like to talk about is, what are these Noahide laws exactly? Well, basically, what these Noahide laws are, are they are, they are some laws, there are seven commandments, if you will, that a gaggle of rabbis had put together and claimed to be the laws for the Gentiles. Now, again, you know, the rabbis always love to separate themselves from the Gentiles. You know, it's always the Jewish uh, rabbis and the rabbinical authority is way, 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 way up here. And, of course, the Gentiles and everybody else is way down here. Now, the Bible warns us about these kinds of things, and it warns us about these kinds of men. We're going to talk a little bit about them a little bit later on in the program. But right now, uh, I, it should suffice to say that these, this group of rabbis, if you will, have said that God commanded Noah uh, to, uh, to do these seven laws or commandments uh, at the time that the ark landed on the ground, and of course Noah and his family exited the ark. Now, we see absolutely no evidence of this anywhere, bar none, within the Torah which is simply not in there, which is simply not there. However, whenever these rabbinical characters want to make up something new, they simply say, well, this is written by one of our sages, right? Or it's in our Talmud, right? And so it's very easy for them to say, well, you know, this has been tradition with us for thousands of years or whatever the case might be in order to sell the snake oil that they are selling. And once again, my friends, we are a Bible-only ministry at Holy Impact Ministries. If it's in the Bible, we absolutely love it and we absolutely abide by it. If it's not in the Bible, uh, then we don't abide in it. Then it's just that simple for us. Uh, just that simple. You know, we were warned over and over in the Bible about men who would creep in unknowingly to make lasciviousness out of the gospel of our Messiah. And we are constantly on the watch for these things. But these Noahide laws basically are seven commandments. And I'd like to kind of read you what these seven commandments are and what they say. The first one is not to, pray, not to profane God's oneness in any way. Okay, so we don't profane God's oneness in any way. That doesn't sound too terrible bad. How about the second one? Not to curse your creator. Okay, again, not too bad. We can accept that. The third one is not to murder. That's a good one. Number four is not to eat the limb of a living animal. I think that most of us probably would not do that. Number five is not to steal. Okay, another good one. Number six is to harness the human libido. Now, this basically has to do with sexuality, rape, adultery, uh, homosexuality, those types of things. So that kind of encapsulates a whole lot of different things. And number seven, listen to number seven. Number seven is to establish courts of law to ensure justice in our world. Now, I find this pretty interesting. The first thing I'd like to ask you is, why do men make laws? Why do men make laws? Does anybody make a law that they don't plan on enforcing? 
Think about that for just a minute, a minute as we continue on. At first, these Noahide laws really don't sound all that bad. And even on the internet today, we have website upon website out there that are calling people to become not a Christian, but a Noahide. All kinds of uh, websites are on the internet right now enticing people to become what they call a Noahide. Now, again, at first glance, these commandments really don't sound too terribly bad. But I have to ask, what about the seventh-day Sabbath? Where's that in the Noahide law? What about the blue cords that Yahuwah God commands his children to wear on their hips so that they won't chasten after their own hearts, but that they will chasten after God's heart? What about those? What about worshiping other gods and other idols? What about honoring your mother and your father? What about hearing, bearing false witness against your neighbor? What about not coveting what your neighbor has? What about all of those things? And, and on and on and on and on the list goes. You know, when you look at the Torah, again, for those of you who don't know, the Torah is the first five books of the Bible. It is the spoken word of God. When we look at the, the, uh, the Torah, we see a much different law than what the Pharisees today are claiming that we need to keep. And again, my friends, uh, most Christians are completely unaware of this, but I did want to bring this uh, to your attention. Most Christians are completely unaware of the fact that the Noahide laws were recognized by the United States Congress in the preamble of the 1991 bill that establishes Education Day here in the United States. Did you know that? And again, I have that bill. I have it right here on my desk. And again, I'd like to read it to you. It says this. It says, whereas Congress recognizes the historical tradition of the ethical values and principles, which are the basis of civilized society and upon which our great nation was founded, whereas these ethical values and principles have been the bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization, when they were known as the Noahide Law, This is in a bill in Congress. And so these Pharisees have gotten into the United States Congress and convinced them that their Noahide laws are the bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization. Very interesting. Very interesting. Once again, my friends, people who write laws write them for a reason. They write them so that they can be enforced. And so... What are these pharisaical, this pharisaical gaggle of men? What are they doing? What's the point in all of this? And again, you can see that these Noahide laws go back to 1991, and that's how they got into this bill. And apparently, it was the birthday of one of these uh, elitist uh, rabbis uh, that actually shoved this over the edge and got it in front of Congress and, uh, and made its way into the bill. And so, once again, my friends, I ask you, why do people make laws? Why would they make such laws if they didn't plan on enforcing them? And this is a question that we need to, to, to answer. And again, it's no coincidence that uh, these rabbinical Pharisees have brought these things to the United States Congress and actually convinced the United States Congress that these Noahide laws, and, and again, are the bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization. Is that true? We don't find that in our Bible anywhere. But Congress is completely convinced of it, so much so that they put it in a bill. So, I'd like to read you a couple of things out of the Torah itself, from the book of Deuteronomy. Now, for those of you who don't think that the book of Deuteronomy is very important, I would like to remind you that when the devil took our Messiah up on the, on the mountain to tempt him, every response that our Messiah gave to the devil came from the book of Deuteronomy. He, did, he didn't just think of these things off the top of his head. They came from the book of Deuteronomy. So the, it was the book of Deuteronomy that caused the devil to flee our Messiah. 
So I just want you to know that. And this is what we're going to be talking about here. This scripture right here that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32. I'd like to read this to you. I'd like to read two of them, actually. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32 says this. Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it, and you shall not take away from it. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2 says this. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of Yahuwah your God, that I command you, says Yahuwah God. Now, again, if Yahuwah God speaks something to us, that is law. That's his word, it's his spoken word, and whatever Yahuwah God speaks becomes universal law. And this is very important for us to remember. So God says, not to add to his word and not to take away from his word. If you do, what is that called? That's called sin. Sin. What is sin according to the Bible? According to your New Testament, the Apostle John tells us that sin is the transgression of the law. That's the biblical definition of sin. If you don't have the law, then you, don't, you can't have sin because sin is the transgression of the law. What are these rabbinical Pharisees doing writing this Noahide law and telling us now that there's really only these seven commandments to keep. Is that not adding to the word of God and taking away from the word of God? Because I would contend to you uh, and submit to you, my friends, that it is adding to the word and taking away from the word of God. Again, these Noahide laws are not found anywhere within the Torah. So, something else that the Torah says that these rabbinical Pharisees seem to forget they're supposed to be men of God, they're supposed to be men of the Torah, they're supposed to be uh, agents of God, if you will, ambassadors, right? Well, what about this? Again, Exodus chapter 12, verses 48 through 51. Let me read this to you. If a sojourner shall sojourn with you and would like to keep the Passover to Yehovah, let all of his males be circumcised. Now, again, this is Exodus chapter 12, verse 48. What is this stranger? Who's this stranger? The stranger is a Gentile. They call them Gentiles in the New Testament, right? So the stranger that is not a natural born Israelite. He is born outside of the house of Israel, right? So he is a Gentile. So it says here in Exodus chapter 12, verse 48, if a Gentile stranger shall sojourn, travel with you, and he'd like to keep the Passover to Yahuwah, let all of his males be circumcised. So, was Yahuwah God calling for the Gentiles to be circumcised? Yes, he was. Was Yahuwah God grafting the Gentile into the house of Israel clear back in the book of Exodus? In the beginning of the Bible? Yes, he was. Let's read the rest of it. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land. So this Gentile now, if all of his males are circumcised, he then becomes as a native of the land, says Yahuwah God. I'm reading this right out of the Torah. Exodus chapter 12, verse 48. But, God says, no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native Israelite, and for the Gentile stranger who sojourns among you. Now, my friends, that is Exodus chapter 12, verse 49. And I'd like you to highlight that in your Bible. Again, let me read that to you again. There shall be one law for the native uh, Israelite and for the Gentile stranger who sojourns travels among you. All the people of Israel did just as Yahuwah God commanded Moses and Aaron and on that very day, Yahuwah brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their host. Now, if that's not enough, let's turn to Numbers chapter 15, verses 14 and 15. And let's read that as well. Starting with Numbers chapter 15, verse 14, it says, And if a Gentile stranger is traveling with you, or anyone is living permanently among you, and he wishes to offer a food offering with a pleasant, uh, pleasing aroma to Yahuwah, he shall do as you do. For the assembly, 
both the, the native-born house of Israel, which includes all 12 tribes, including Judah, the Jews, right? All the house of Israel for the assembly and the Gentile stranger. There shall be one statute for you and for the stranger, the Gentile stranger who travels with you. A statute forever throughout your generations. You and the sojourner, the traveler, the Gentile traveler, shall be alike before Yahovah. My friends, it's all, it's all throughout the Torah. It's all throughout the Torah. There is one law for both Jew and Gentile, not two laws. There is one law for the house of Israel, all 12 tribes. Everybody, included the grafted in. Not says I, but says your God breathed scripture. So what in the world do these rabbinical Pharisees today think they're doing by creating these seven Noahide laws? I ask you plainly. I ask you plainly. So Paul teaches us in the 11th chapter of the book of Romans, that the Gentiles are grafted into the olive tree that is the house of Israel. And if that is true, then once again there is still one law for the Jew and for the Gentile. And Paul makes that very, very clear in Romans chapter 11. And he tells us that many of the Jews will be uh, actually cut out of the olive tree because of their unbelief. And he tells us in Romans chapter 11, he says, but you Gentile, he says, even though you have been grafted in to the olive tree, he says, do not look down on the Jews because the, the Jews are the root, not you. And they have been cut off because of their unbelief. Then he tells us, he says, you be careful, you Gentile, because you also will be cut off if you do not continue in the kindness of Yahuwah God. Okay, so it's all about this olive tree where we are all grafted into the olive tree. And Paul tells us that many of the unbelieving Jews at the end of the age will be grafted back into the olive tree. Okay, so this is all in Romans chapter 11. You can read it for yourself. I don't want to do a whole study here on Romans chapter 11. We could do that. But I do want to read you what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 through 29. Let me read that to you. It says this. It says, For as many of you as were baptized into the Messiah have put on the Messiah. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Now, Greek, once again, what's a Greek? That's someone who is not born by blood, an Israelite. That's a Gentile. Okay, so there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in the Messiah, Yeshua. And if you are the Messiahs, and of course that's a big if, there's that big two-letter word there, humongous word, if you are the Messiahs, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Again, there is no Jew, no Gentile. The same thing as Exodus tells us. The same thing as Numbers tells us. The same thing Paul says in uh, uh, Romans chapter 11. The same thing he says here in Galatians. Yahuwah God, it's always been Yahuwah God's message. What were the Israelites put on earth for? They were put on earth to be a light on the hill to attract all other nations to them. Because they would have been blessed had they obeyed what Yahuwah God had told them to do which they did not. And I'm certainly not pointing at them because we modern day Christians have done the exact same thing. We also have gone off the rails. We also have our sports gods that we worship and our American idols that we worship. And we also are adding to God's word and taking away from God's word. With the first day of the week, Sunday Sabbath, not commanded by anyone anywhere in the Bible. Good Friday, Easter, Christ Mass, you name it. And so we Christians have done the same thing. So we're certainly not anti-Semitic. And I just want to say that very quickly here uh, so that nobody gets the wrong idea here. 
You see, we understand where the Pharisees come from, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Again, these rabbinical Pharisees, these, these men that call themselves rabbi. Who are they? We know who they are. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit. I want to, I want to talk a little bit about the, the fact that uh, you does not mean that you are anti-Semitic when you speak against the rabbi. And I want people to know that we love the Jewish people. We are grafted into a Hebrew Jewish man by the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. And again, for those of you who think that his name is Jesus, again, no one had ever even heard the name Jesus until the 16th century, just a couple of hundred years ago. Again, if you look at your 1611 King James Bible, you will see that the name Jesus is not in the, King, the original King James Version of the Bible. Why is that? Well, it's because there was no J sound in the Greek language. The, the J, the guttural J, J sound, was not added to the Greek language until the late 15th century, and it didn't, wasn't really popularly used until the late 16th century. And so the original name of our Messiah was Jesus, in the original King James Version of the Bible, and that was Greek for Yeshua, which was his Hebrew name. So, again, no one had ever even heard the name Jesus until the 16th century. And again, Jesus is a Greek translation. It's a literal translation from the Hebrew. And again, it was Jesus, they added J to the, to the language, it then becomes Jesus, and they put Jesus in the Bible, because Jesus, 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 Jesus. But nobody understands that their Messiah was a Hebrew Jew who came from the tribe of Judah and the house of David. And if you don't believe that, you need to read 2 Samuel chapter 7, and I encourage you to do that uh, if you do not know what 2 Samuel chapter 7 is all about. But again, we are certainly not anti-Semitic. We love our brothers and sisters who are Jewish believers. And the Bible says that we are, we, we are hated and they are our enemy for our sake. But they are loved because of their forefathers. God loves them because of their forefathers. And it, it is written that their darkness has come upon the Jews so that they will not understand until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. We understand that. We get that. But, by the same token, you cannot blatantly walk over God's word. You cannot blatantly break his commandment. You cannot blatantly be like the rabbinical Pharisees of our Messiah's time, who our Messiah called the children of the devil in Matthew chapter 23. He also called them a brood of vipers. He called them whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside full of dead men's bones on the inside. You just can't make up laws like these Noahide laws and get them passed through Congress and make them believe that they are somehow God-given when they certainly are not God-given. They are man-made and get away with it. Again, adding to God's word, taking away from God's word is a sin. And the Noahide laws are not in the Torah. Now, some of these laws match the commandments that are, are in the Torah, but they are in no way all-inclusive, not in any way, shape, or form. And these websites make it sound like, oh, you have some kind of special spiritual knowledge if you become a Noahide. My friends, if you become a Noahide, what you become is lost. Read your Bible for yourself. Read your Bible for yourself. So how could these laws be used by a, let's say, a one world order or a dictatorship? And that's what I really want to talk about here today. Again, laws are written to be enforced, and it's important for us to, to know this and to, to, uh, to remember this. Now, what is going on in the world today? Is there a one world government that is coming on, uh, or that is seen on the horizon today. Yes, there is. You know it, and I know it. I have never seen so many world organizations as they are right now. And the World Health Organization now is trying to make laws that are binding in all nations of the earth concerning 
well, let's just say the witch's brew. My friends, this is not a game. And who's at the head of a lot of this stuff? And a lot of people don't understand it, but it is the Roman Catholic Pope. The Roman Catholic Pope at the Vatican, I tell you, my friends, has had this ecumenical drive to bring in all other religions, all other religions, under, back underneath the umbrella of Roman Catholicism. Now, my friends, we all know what happened when all the earth was under the rule of Roman Catholicism back in the Dark Ages. The Roman Catholic Church has more blood on its hands than Hitler ever even dreamt of. And this is what happened when the Roman Catholic Church had dominion over the earth back in the Dark Ages. And this is exactly what the Roman Catholic Church wants to do again. They want to have this one world religion, and they're doing an, a great job of it. How many people know that there are delegates from every nation in the earth at the Vatican? Every, anybody know that? You should know that. And again, I want to let everybody know that the Pope is to visit Canada in July of this year in order to once again work on uh, sweeping the indigenous uh, communities of Canada under the umbrella of Catholicism. The Indians in Canada. The Pope now wants to sweep them as well underneath that Catholic umbrella, that one world religion that he is once again trying to build in order to regain power over the earth. The Pope of Rome, the one that speaks at the United Nations, the one that has spoken here at Congress, the one that everybody listens to. Again, my friends, watch out, Canadians. Watch out, Canadians. You uh, Metis and you Inuit Indians. The devil is coming to swoon you. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because, once again, the Pope is still on this ecumenical rampage. He's doing everything he can to sweep all religions back under his umbrella. Men like Kenneth Copeland. Uh, men like Joel Olstein, many men have been to the Vatican and are making concessions with Rome. My friends, this is no joke. This is no joke. There is a one world order that is coming and there is a one world religion that is going to come along with the one world order. The idea is to make as much chaos as they possibly can with famines and plagues and all of these different things and riots in the streets and everybody hating one another. What did our Messiah tell us in Matthew chapter 24? He said, because lawlessness will be increased, because lawlessness will be increased, the hearts of many will grow cold. And when they grow cold and chaos ensues, what's going to happen? Well, we then see the white horse rider the white horse rider of Revelation. In will come the white horse rider with the answers to everything to bring peace back again. We need a one world government and a one world religion. And the Pope of Rome wants that one world religion to be Catholic. Now what does this have to do with Noahide laws? Well, it has everything to do with Noahide laws. Again, the uh, Pope of Rome is headed to Canada this July to swoon the native Indians in uh, Canada. And we won't even get into the thousands of dead native tribes uh, of Canada that were found buried on the grounds of Roman Catholic-run schools just about a year ago. Thousands of dead native Canadians found dead on the grounds of schools that were run by the Roman Catholic Church. I'm hoping that someone brings this up when the Pope of Rome comes. I'm sure he'll apologize for that. Sure he will. If you think that the Pope of Rome is not trying to swoon all religions under his umbrella to come back so that he might have power over the world through this one world religion that he is creating. I want to read you a couple of headlines here. This one is from the National Catholic Reporter, September 15th of 2021. It says, 
Vatican publishes letters to rabbis emphasizing Pope's respect for Judaism. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice of the Pope? Now, all of a sudden, the Roman Catholic Pope has respect for Judaism. Here's another one. New York Times, November 2, 2009. The Pope meets with Jewish leaders at the Vatican. What are Jewish leaders doing in the devil's den? I ask you plainly. What are Jewish leaders doing at the Vatican? Again, the Vatican is working. Working. He's playing the Jews. He's playing the rabbis. He's playing his hand, my friends. Again, NPR, May 20th of 2014. Pope to travel to Holy Land with rabbi and Muslim leader. With a rabbi and a Muslim leader. Again, where? With the Pope. Why? Because the Pope wants to be the authority. The Pope wants to be the one to say, look at me, I made peace. The Pope wants to be the one to say, look, I'm your religious leader. I'm God on earth. I am the Son of God. Kiss my golden ring as I sit upon my golden throne. Do you see how this all plays out? Here's another one for you. BBC News, September 12th, 2021, just last year, Pope warns of anti-Semitism as he visits Hungary. The Pope of Rome warns of anti-Semitism. See how, see how worried the Pope of Rome is now uh, of anti-Semitism? See how, see how he's emphasizing now the Pope is with the respect for Judaism? Do you, what, what is all this about? Again, it's about him trying to set the groundwork, the foundation, to prove to the world that he is the one that needs to be the world's religious leader. Here's another one. Catholic Agency, September 10th, 2021. Catholic News Agency says, Vatican Cardinal reassures Jewish leaders over Pope Francis' comments on the Torah. Again, he's very concerned about what the Jews think all of a sudden. And so we have this back and forth going on between the Babylonian rabbis who came up out of Babylon and the Pope of Rome, who is essentially Babylon. Again, my friends, we need to know and we need to understand these things and we need to keep our eye on what is going on in the world today. Again, uh, there's this give and take going on that leads, is trying to lead to uh, an agreement, a partnership, if you will, that will allow both the rabbis of Israel and the Pope to join forces and the soon coming one world religion. That is coming. It is coming. They're working it out right now. They're hammering, out, hammering it out between themselves. And the Pope has the strongest hand right now, my friends. Again, uh, and if you don't know about the Pope of Rome, you don't know about the blood that has been spilled by the Roman Catholic Church and exactly who the Pope of Rome is, I'd like you to visit our website at holyimpactministries.com and I'd like you to view our Revelations Secret Key documentary. Again, it's called Revelations Secret Key. It's right on the front page. Go to holyimpactministries.com. It's absolutely free. It doesn't cost a dime. Uh, and you can watch that and know who the Pope of Rome is and how this is all playing out. Uh, and while you're there, you might, al might also want to take a look at Christmas. It's not what you think. That's another documentary. Again, where does Christmas come from? It's not Christmas. It's Christ Mass. It was created by the Pope of Rome. Why is that? Well, you need to go watch the documentary if you want to know more than that. So, once again, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the rabbis who made these Noahide laws. You know, it's, it's always one deception or another deception. Who are the rabbis? Let me ask you this. Why are there no rabbis in your Old Testament? Do you know why there's no rabbis in your Old Testament? Let me tell you why there's no rabbis in your Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, in the Torah, the writings of the prophets and the Psalms, there was only, only the high priest, who is the bloodline of Aaron, and the Levitical priesthood, who were his priests. There were no rabbis. So where did rabbis come from? If they're not in the Old Testament, and if God didn't command them to be, 
then who are they? My friends, rabbis are a byproduct of Babylon. When the southern kingdom, Judah and some Benjamites, the southern kingdom had disobeyed Yahovah God, they were taken into bondage under Babylon. And the temple at that point in time was sacked, and all of the utensils from the temple and the, the showbread and the uh, candlestick and the menorah, all that stuff, was all sacked. It was all taken. And of course, a lot of that stuff was made out of gold. They took all that stuff. They rampaged everything. They took the, what was left of the survivors to Babylon. And the, uh, the southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin were uh, basically slaves in Babylon. During that time, because there was no more temple, they began to build synagogues, and they elected for themselves what they called rabbi. What does rabbi mean? Rabbi means master or great one, is what rabbi means. So they created these men for themselves. Sounds good now. So now they've got these synagogues that are kind of all over Babylon that are kind of like churches today, right? And you're thinking in your mind, you're thinking, well, this is good. Now they're coming, they're coming back to Yahweh God. Maybe they'll even uh, convert the Babylonians, right? No, no, my friends, no, no. These Babylonian rabbis are the same men that our Messiah called children of the devil. They are the rabbinical Pharisees that brought all kinds of uh, pagan garbage up out of Babylon. This is who they are. The Talmud that they have written for themselves is nothing more than an encyclopedia of the writings of men. What does God say? He says, you shall obey my commandments, not man's commandments. But the rabbinical rabbis, for the pharisaical rabbis, what do they do? Anytime they want to change something, they just say, well, one of our sages uh, put that in the Talmud, so uh, it's law now. Adding to God's word, taking away from God's word. Now, Again, there are no rabbis in the Torah. They are indeed an invention of Babylon. In fact, when they came up out of Babylon, they even changed the names of the Jewish months. The names of the Jewish months have even been changed. And they again have, have, have used Babylonian gods for the names of the months. I'd like to present you with a short, uh, a short insert from an article written by a, a gentleman by the name of Nehemiah Gordon. And uh, this article that he wrote was How Yom Teruah Became Rosh Hashanah. Have you ever heard of Rosh Hashanah? That was brought up out of Babylon by the, uh, rabbin uh, the, the rabbinical Pharisees. It's supposed to be the day of trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, day of shouting. What did they turn it into? They turned it into the Jewish New Year. It's in the seventh month for Pete's sake. God tells us that his New Year is in the book of Exodus, is in the spring during his month of Passover. Not in the, his seventh month. But again, they bring all of this garbage up from Babylon. And so once again, before I do, I'd like to introduce you very quickly to a, this gentleman by the name of Nehemiah Gordon. Nehemiah Gordon earned his Ph.D. from Barlin University in Biblical Studies. And Nehemiah Gordon also holds a master's degree in the Biblical Studies and a bachelor's degree in archaeology from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He also worked as a translator on the Dead Sea Scrolls and as a researcher deciphering Hebrew manuscripts. Now, listen to what uh, Nehemiah Gordon, and Nehemiah Gordon, by the way, is a Karaite Jew. Now, a Karaite Jew is someone who does not believe in Yeshua, Jesus, but he also does not believe in the, in the Talmud, in a lot of the garbage and the filth and the trash that many rabbis do believe in. And this is what he says about uh, Yom Teruah and Rosh Hashanah in the days of the, the naming of the Jewish months that came up out of Babylon. Listen to what he says. He says, Today, few people remember the biblical name of Yom Teruah, and instead it's widely known as Rosh Hashanah, which literally means head of the year, and hence also New Year's. The transformation of Yom Teruah, the day of shouting, into Rosh Hashanah, New Year's, 
is the result of pagan Babylonian influence upon the Jewish nation. The first stage in the transformation was the, adop the adoption of the Babylonian month names. In the Torah, the months are numbered as first month, second month, third month, etc. You can find that in Leviticus 23 and Numbers 28. During their sojourn in Babylonia, our ancestors began to use the pagan Babylonian month names, a fact readily admitted in the Talmud. The names of the month came up with them from Babylonian. Again, this is in the Jerusalem Talmud under Rosh Hashanah. The pagan nature of the Babylonian month names is epitomized by the fourth month known as Tammuz. In the Babylonian religion, Tammuz was the god of grain, whose annual death and resurrection brought fertility to the world. In the book of Ezekiel, the prophet described a journey to Jerusalem in which he saw the Jewish women sitting in the temple weeping over Tammuz. And you can read about that in Ezekiel chapter 8. The reason they were weeping over Tammuz is that according to Babylonian mythology, Tammuz had been slain but had not yet been resurrected. In ancient Babylonia, the time for weeping over Tammuz was early summer, when the rain ceased throughout the Middle East and green vegetation is burnt by the unrelenting sun. To this day, the fourth month in the rabbinical calendar is known as the month of Tammuz, and it is still a time for weeping and mourning. Now, my friends, I ask you plainly once again, if this is not adding to the Word of God and taking away from the Word of God, I don't know what is. This is the same rabbinical, these are the same rabbinical uh, characters that have come up with this Noahide law, trying to convince us all that there are two laws, one for the Jew and one for the Gentile now, completely uh, destroying the Torah and the Word of God. So we have these Babylonian rabbis. And they have renamed God's months with the names of pagan gods and found nowhere in the Torah. They've added a second new year to God's year in the seventh month, found nowhere in the Torah. They commanded people in our Messiah's time to wash their hands before they ate. That's found nowhere in the Torah. Again, they said that you couldn't pop a few grains uh, in your mouth as you were walking through the field on the Sabbath. They said that that was harvesting. My friends, that's not harvesting. That's found nowhere in the Torah. In fact, it is commanded in the Torah that farmers were to leave the edges of their field and, and not to harvest them, to allow travelers and the poor to eat. They were not to glean the edges of their fields. They were to leave them for travelers and for sojourners, says the Torah. So there was nothing wrong when we read about uh, the apostles eating grain as they went and the Pharisees uh, accusing them of harvesting. That's not harvesting. You can ask any farmer what harvesting is. Harvesting is hard work, my friends. It's not stripping a few grains and popping them in your mouth as you walk along on the Sabbath day. Again, that's found nowhere in the Torah. Again, they stole the seat of the high priest during our Messiah's time. The, the, the bloodline of Aaron uh, was the only one that was allowed to be a high priest. That was completely abolished and stolen uh, during the days of our Messiah. The high priest that was actually accusing our Messiah was really no high priest at all because he was not in the bloodline of Aaron. And we know that through our history books. King Herod himself appointed six high priests that became a political merry-go-round, a seat, if you will. And it was a political uh, game that uh, the Romans said who the next high priest was going to be. Again, that's found nowhere in the Torah. They made up their own Sanhedrin. Where is that found? That's not found in the Torah anywhere. Now they create for themselves a new law for both Jew and Gentile. And we're supposed to swallow that without even checking the Torah to see if it is God-given or not. Once again, my friends, we must read the book. If we're not reading the book, we're going to fall for anything, and especially in these last days that we are now living in. And so I want us to know this. Again, Exodus chapter 12, 48, I want to read it again. 
If a Gentile stranger shall sojourn with you and would like to keep the Passover to Yahuwah, let all of his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. Again, Numbers chapter 15, For the assembly there shall be one statute for you and for the stranger who sojourns with you, a statute forever throughout your generations. You and the sojourner, the Gentile sojourner, the traveler, shall be alike before Yahuwah. What did our Messiah tell these children of the devil in the first place? I'd like to read you Matthew chapter 23, verse 8. Matthew chapter 23, verse 8, red letter words from our Messiah. This is a red letter commandment from our Messiah. He says, but you are not to be called rabbi. That is a red letter commandment from our Messiah. Matthew chapter 3, verse 8. You are not to be called rabbi, for you have one master. That word there is kathagetes in the Greek, and it means master. He says, you're not to be called rabbi, for you have one master, and you are all brothers. And call no man father on, your, on the earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Now, who is our Messiah talking about when he says, call no man father on the earth? Again, he's talking about your father in heaven. You have one father who is in heaven like the Catholics do when they have you call their priest father and they ball face lie to you and your children and say that they, have the, they are your father and they have the power to forgive you of your sin. They have no power at all, my friends. They have none, no power. No man has the power to forgive sin. That is blasphemy in the highest. Again, that comes from the devil's church, my friends. This is the father that our Messiah is talking about. Again, he's not talking about your earthly father that you can't call your earthly father your earthly father. Fathers are mentioned all throughout the Bible. It is, the commandment is to honor your mother and your father. So it's not, he's not talking about earthly, fleshly fathers. He's talking about earthly spiritual fathers. Call no one your spiritual father because you have one father, one high, most high father who is in heaven. Again, these are easy things to understand, my friends, if we would just sit down and pray and ask for the discernment to understand them. Again, uh, Genesis chapter 17, verse 5, uh, Abraham is called the father of all nations. So it's not uh, uh, against the law or against the red letter commandment to call your father your father or the, the father of uh, uh, your, the Bill of Rights or whatever you might want to say there. He's talking about spiritual, your spiritual father. You only have one of those. Again, he continues on in Matthew chapter 23, verse 10, and he says, Neither be called master. Again, there's that word, kathagetes, again, in Matthew chapter 23, 10, and it means master. Uh, in some of your Bibles, it may say instructor. That is an incorrect uh, translation of the Greek language. Again, it is kathagetes, and it means master. Neither be called master, for you have one master, the Messiah. The greatest among you, listen to this now, Matthew chapter 23, verse 11, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Your servant. Diakonos. Diakonos in the Greek. So the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Humbled by who? Humbled by Yahuwah God. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be the one that is actually exalted, my friends. Not the, not the person who says, uh, I'm the boss. I'm the one who tells you what God's law is. I'm the one who's going to let you know how things are going to roll here. I'm a high and far above you. No, 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 my friends. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. And the Bible says so, and our very own Messiah makes that very clear. So what do we know concerning these Noahide laws? Here's what we know in review. They were made up, and they are found nowhere in your Bible, number one. They were created by Babylonian rabbis who came up out of Babylon and have mocked the word of God ever since. There is one law for both Jew and Gentile, according to Yahuwah God and his Torah and the New Testament. The inept United States Congress now believes that these Noahide laws are the bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization. 
They even wrote it into their 1991 education bill. That's how convinced they are of the Noahide law. That gives you a little inkling of the intelligence of the people that we have in Congress right now. Apparently, they didn't read their Bible either. The Pope of Rome is working to bring the Jews back under his authority along with the rest of the world. What else do we know? We know that laws are not written for no reason. Laws are always written because men want to enforce those laws. Nobody sits down and writes a law for nothing unless they plan on enforcing it. We also know that it is a sin to add to God's word and to take away from God's word. We also know that the devil does not want you to know these things. The devil does not want you to know these things. And we also know that those who do not know their history are bound to repeat it. And that is a true, that's not just a cliche, my friends. It is absolutely true. So, I just want to ask, uh, ask you this. Those of you who have fallen for this Noahide uh, deception, what are you going to say on Judgment Day when you're standing before your Messiah? Are you going to look up at him and tell him, I am a Noahide? Where do you think that's going to get you? I obeyed the rabbi. My friends, I'd like to read you exactly where that's going to get you. You can find that in Matthew chapter 7, starting with verse 21. Let me read this to you. Red letter words from our Messiah. He says this. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, I'd like to stop right there, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Our Messiah says, you can call me Lord all day long. It doesn't matter. You're not going to enter in the kingdom of heaven. The only one getting into the kingdom of heaven is the one who's doing the will of my Father who is in heaven, says our Messiah in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Listen to what else he says, Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. He says, on that day, many will come to me and they'll say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do all kinds of mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And again, that word there in again in the Greek is anomia, which means illegality, violation of law, iniquity, transgression and unrighteousness lawlessness. Again, it means lawlessness. So, these people are going to come to him, and they're going to beat on their chest, and they're going to say, you know, we prophesied in your name, and we cast out all kinds of demons in your name, we did all kinds of mighty works in your name, and he's going to look them dead in the eye and say, I don't even know who you are. I don't even know who you are. Get away from me, you who are lawless. You who are lawless. So how can we protect ourselves from these kinds of things? Read your Bible. Read your Bible. That's how you protect yourself. How can you know that you are following the true Messiah? Read your Bible. It's in your Bible. What to do, what not to do, what he says to do, what he says not to do, what to be called, what not to be called. It's in your Bible. Read your Bible. How can you truly serve your Messiah with true, unadulterated love? Read your Bible. Read your Bible. How can you be invited into his kingdom? Read your Bible. My friends, it's all there. How can you receive the crown of salvation? Again, my friends, it is not about going down to the front of the aisle and letting some stranger pray over you so that he can save you. The prayer of confession, my friends, is the first step in a journey. And it must be done by you. And the words must be spoken by your lips. And you must repent. You must be baptized. You must go down into that watery grave of baptism in order to be raised up a new creature, following your Messiah down into death, 
so that you can be a new creature created by Yahovah with the law of Yahovah written across your heart. As Yahovah promised us in the Old Testament in Jeremiah chapter 31 and the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 10. These are important things, my friends. They're very, very important things. And I hope that the information that we have given you concerning these Noahide laws and the ecumenical movement of the Roman Catholic Pope will be something that you, again, will take into consideration uh, this week as we continue to pray for our enemies. It is written that we need to pray for our enemies. We need to pray for everyone. We need to pray, pray for our leaders and our, 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 our officials in Congress, uh, our, our senators, uh, our congressmen, the president of the United States, city councilmen, all the way on up. We are to pray for them, and we ought to pray for them. But my friends, it does not say that we are, allowed, we are to let our enemies lead us. That's not what we are to do. Again, we are to stand. The Bible says that he who shrinks back will be destroyed. We are called to endure to the end and to conquer. And this is exactly what we must do in these last days. These Noahide laws, this ecumenical movement that we see going on, this visitation from the Roman Catholic Pope to Canada to swoon the native uh, Canadians uh, up there, again, is all part and parcel of this new world order that is to come. And Antichrist is, has been here for uh, a long time, my friends. He is the Roman Catholic Pope. You know, Daniel tells us in uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, he prophesied that the beast would indeed come and he would, he would indeed change the times and the law of God. Who changed the times and the law of God? Why don't we keep God's festivals and God's feast days and God's Sabbaths? Why do we no longer keep them? Because of Pope Gregory. We now keep the Gregorian calendar. Where did we get that from? We got it from Pope Gregory. He's, his calendar is the calendar that we all keep today. Who thought to change the times and the laws? The Roman Catholic popes did it, my friends. And did they not change the law? You bet they changed the law. And our Protestant churches today, are, are who protest against absolutely nothing, are nothing more than the byproducts of their mother, Church of Rome. Again, my friends, these are evil and wicked days that we live in. My hope and my prayer is that the information that we have provided you here today through the truth of prophecy will be able to be used by you to be careful and to watch for these kinds of things. Watch this Antichrist and his ecumenical movement. Watch the rabbinical Pharisees who are Messiah called the children of the devil. Watch what is coming upon the land. Read. Matthew chapter 24, read the book of Revelation, read Daniel, read Ezekiel, read your Bible from the beginning in the book of Genesis. Know and understand what it says. And if you need help, join us at holyimpactministries.com. We can walk you right through the Torah hand by hand. We have videos all the way up from, the Genesis, from Genesis on up, and we are now moving into out of the book of Numbers and into Deuteronomy during our Wednesday night Bible studies. I'd like to invite you to that. They are Wednesday evening, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, live. Uh, and you can also download the PDF file for that study as well. There, All of it is free at our website at Holy Impact Ministries. We do not sell the Word of God at our ministry at Holy Impact Ministries. Everything we do is absolutely free. We want even the poorest among us to be able to have the Word of God. With that being said, everybody, I just want to say God bless you. Thank you so very much for your time. We appreciate you so very, very, very much. And before I let you go, I'd just like to say a quick prayer over us all. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray, Father, blessed and holy is your name, high and far above all names. We love you, Father, so very, very much. We thank you, Father, for your word that we have that helps us to navigate through these evil and wicked days that we are now living in. 
We thank you, Father, for this navigation that you have given us. We thank you for your mercy and for your grace. We thank you for your only begotten Son, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham, who does indeed now sit upon the throne of David at your right hand. We thank you, Father, for the gospel message that he has brought to us. We thank you, Father, for having him be our leader that would lead us back to you. We thank you, Father, that he was able to become your word made flesh. And we thank you, Father, that he calls us also to pick up our crosses and to follow him so that we also may become your word made flesh. We pray, Father, that you would write your commandments, your laws, your feast days, your, your precepts across our hearts, and that you would be with us and that you would walk with us. We pray, Father, that you would give us the tenacity to once again endure to the end and to conquer as you have called us to do. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we thank you so very, very much for all that you have done and all that you will do. In the name of Yeshua, our blessed Messiah and King, we pray these things. Once again, everyone, thank you so very much. We certainly do appreciate you. We will see you again on the next Truth of Prophecy.